Okay. Okay. Now we have Dr. Liu is here. Okay. Great. Sorry, I was <laughs> in a meeting, so. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. No problem. Yeah. It is about, it is about uh, the, the right time. Yeah. Um, I would like to, to introduce uh, Dr. Xiaoming Liu, and uh, he's an associate professor in Michigan State University. Uh, he received his PhD from Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, before joining MSU, he was a research scientist in, in GE, GE Global Research, for almost, almost eight years. I, I, I think that uh, should be a correct number. Sorry. Yeah, and uh, uh, he has been program chair uh, for WACV 2018, BTAS. 2018, uh, an area chair for many top conferences, NeuroApes, uh, CVPR, ECCV, ICCV, and associate editor for neurocomputing, pattern recognition letters, and uh, pattern recognition, journal pattern recognition. Uh, he has been known for prior based 3D reconstruction. And uh, recently, uh, from what I know, uh, he has been working with Ford Motor Company uh, for 3D object detection and depth estimation for those research work used for autonomous driving. And uh, he has been uh, granted for many awards, like best paper, best industry related paper run up in ICP, you know, at ICPR, uh, twice best student paper at WC, best post award for uh, at BMW, BMWC. Um, we are looking forward to, to Dr. Liu's talk and uh, let's welcome. Okay, thank you very much for the intro introduction. Sorry, I was uh, late a few minutes. Uh, so let me uh, share some of our work uh, in terms of uh, monocular vision-based uh, 3D perception. Uh, can you see my slides? Uh, we can see, but it seems like we are in, the, in, another, in another mode. You see another, <laughs> yeah, right now it's, it's correct, yes. Okay, very good. So yeah, so I think, uh, you know, for people working on automobile driving, you know, we understand the importance of 3D perception, right? So conventional vision problem typically giving uh, uh, image sequences you like to, you know, understand seeing in the 2D sense. But for automobile driving, uh, 3D perception is very important. You wish to understand, uh, you know, detect object, uh, you know, tracking as well forecasting do everything in the, in the three dimensional space. So for this kind of problem, typically uh, we like to use multiple sensors such as a LiDAR, a radar, and uh, RGB cameras. And sometimes not just one sensor, we like to use multiple sensors for the robustness. Uh, but you know, from research perspective, oftentimes people in vision like to see that, you know, how much we can do with a single camera. Can I still do single camera based uh, three dimensional uh, perception? So this is a question kind of interests us as well. So we have been working on this problem in the past two, three years. So we had a, you know, a number of work in this, in this topic. So today I'd like to focus on two different topics. One is three dimensional detection from, uh, from monocular uh, image and videos as well as a three dimensional reconstruction. Um, so in particular, giving an uh, image uh, in uh, automatic driving, we like to detect object in the, in the 3D scene, uh, which means that you have a box around every single uh, object, especially for, for, uh, for cars, um, pedestrian, as well as, uh, um, as well as bicycle, as well as cyclist. In addition, we also like to do 3D surface reconstruction for every, uh, for every vehicles, as well as um, you know, potential other objects. So with this capability, eventually you can uh, render or look at the, you know, the object from, from, from different view angles um, uh, in this case. So let's start with the first topic of uh, three-dimensional uh, detection. So this work was initially published in ICCV last year uh, with my student Garrick. And uh, later on, we had a, a more collaboration with uh, Gerard and, uh, and, and Burnett. And this work right now is under review for that's what, that would be the second part for video based three dimensional object detection. So I'll start with the first part. The goal of uh, monocular 3D detection is that uh, giving uh, image or video sequences we like to be able to detect uh, um, all the object here in this case would be the uh, uh, cars, pedestrian as well as cyclist. So we want to have a single model can detect uh, you know, all three different object types. So we are certainly not the first uh, group working on this. There has been previous work on this topic. Uh, in summary, previous work typically using external networks and, uh, and they also require multi-stage uh, you know, um, training as well as testing. 
Uh, for example, in this deep 3D box, which was in CPR 17, uh, there's a 2D RPN module trying to, you know, generate the boxes from, 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 from 2D perspective, and then try to fit the 3D into the 2D detection results. And later on in the fusion, multi fusion approach in, uh, in CPR 18, there's also a separate module to do the depth estimation. So this kind of module is, is fixed as well as it's an external network. In comparison, what we're trying to do is that we like to have a single network, uh, have a single stage, uh, do this kind of 3D, uh, 3D detection work, okay? So uh, because we don't want to you know, necessarily rely on the 2D information, we have to redefine the anchors. So in this case, uh, when we define anchor, we have uh, information indicate the 2D height and the width. We also in information indicate the three-dimensional H, L, and W, as well as the theta angles. And we also have the projected center in terms of X, Y, Z, P, right? So this equation describes how the X, Y, Z, 3D, which is where the label, the ground truth box information of KD database is, how they projected the, into a 2D projection through a projection matrix P, which is also given in the, in the, in the KD database. And uh, the definition of the theta uh, 3D is defined uh, according to the KD definition, where you, you link the centers and then you define the relative angle compared to the compared to axis. So with this kind of anchor definition, now we can take uh, ground truth label the uh, 2D boxes trying to do a clustering and will give me a set of essentially uh, clusters of, 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 of boxes and we treat each one of them as one anchor. So in total, we will generate 12 different times, types of uh, anchors. And for each one of them, we can compute what are the a priori distribution for Z, P, W, H, L, and theta. These are the kind of a priori distribution for different, different types of anchors. You can see that, uh, you know, a big car in 2D typically correspond to close up distance in the, in the Z, P space while smaller car typically corresponding to further weight distance, right? So with this anchor definition, now we can uh, try to visualize them in the, in the 3D space. For example, this is a kind of default 3D anchor we have learned, uh, and then we kind of you know, visualize them in the, in, the, in the 3D space. We have 12 different anchors in total. And this will be a corresponding three-dimensional view angle. Uh, three, uh, this will be the bird eye view uh, of, of the same anchors. So with these anchors, now the detection job is trying to, you know, place those anchors in the in the space, right, with different uh, distance to the cameras, and we see we'll see that which of those anchors will be closer to the ground truth. If they are, then the network will try to learn what are the deviation. I can move around the anchor so that it will eventually overlap with the, with the ground truth in, in the kitty. So this will be essentially the three D detection problem. So uh, specifically, the supervision is like every, you know, if every anchor box has a larger than 0 0.5 IOU with the ground truth box, we consider this will be the candidate. Now for every candidate, the network trying to learn a set of transformation parameter, including C, that's a classification, and uh, X, T, Y, T, Z, T, P, this is essentially will be the uh, this will be the uh, center, deviation of the center. And next will be the deviation of the 3D boxes. And finally, will be the deviation or transformation of the 2D boxes, right? By learning this uh, deviation parameters, now you can move the initial you know, yellow anchor box into the final target box, which will be the ground truth is. So whenever this is happening, then the learning of the transformation parameter is successful, right? So. Once we learn this transformation parameter, now we can uh, take the transformation parameter, which is a color variable, together with the anchor parameter, which is a black color variables, and uh, go through this equation. We can generate the updated 3D boxes, and this will be corresponding updated 2D boxes, right? So because we need to know that how to use the transformation parameter, and those equations tell me uh, the the uh, how to apply it. So knowing this transform parameter, now I can define loss functions. So we will have three loss. So one is classification, typical softmax. Secondly, is trying to make sure that uh, the estimated box is the same as the branch truth box. And finally, it will be the 2D box will also be similar. So we will have three level of, uh, of the loss. So in terms of network architecture, uh, we start with a, a dense net. Uh, the network have two different branch. One is called global branch, branch which is similar to a typical uh, detection network. A novel part will be the second branch we call the local 
steps um, aware convolution. The idea is quite simple. That is, you know, we think when the car object at a different distance, the optimal filter, convolution filter that can detect the you know, key features might be different. For example, when the car is close by, maybe I should have a filter for detecting its tiles, right? But when the car is further away, maybe I should, uh, you know, use uh, de de detect its generic shapes. Um, so by doing this idea, we can actually have different uh, uh, different filter for for object at different uh, at different distance. Yeah. Eventually, these two branch will be combined together using an estimated weights alpha and. Uh, Finally, we'll have the joint uh, deformation parameter in the end. So this idea of the depth of work convolution actually being extended in the latest work. Uh, this is one of the CVPR work, at least in the bottom, called learning depth guided convolution. So this essentially uh, take one step further. Actually, they did uh, quite some interesting things based on the general idea of uh, depth of work convolution. So you can check this out in this year's CVPR. So look at uh, look at some experiments. So. Uh, uh, typical evaluation is done on KDE, so we have three different sets, uh, validation one, two, as well as test set, okay? So normally for each one of them, there are three different types of data, which is easy and moderate and harder data. So we test on all three cases, and this table is for the bird eye view evaluation. And uh, you can see that in this evaluation, you essentially you don't care about the height of the box, right? But the other dimension will still, be, will still matter. Uh, so you can see that compared to the uh, previous best work, the improvement is actually uh, quite quite large. And similarly for the 3D detection, this, this is a harder problem. You can see that overall the number will be lower because uh, even the height of the box will, will, will matter here. Uh, but nevertheless, we still have quite some improvement compared to the uh, previous best work. Okay. So look at some quality results. So this is the uh, detection for cars and pedestrians. And uh, these are the cyclists. And this also um, pedestrians. You can clearly see that the cyclist is a much challenger problem uh, because the box tend to be uh, larger and the orientation estimation will be hard as well. Um, so this shows you some qualitative results uh, in, a, in a video format. So the top is the input video together with uh, detection results. In the bottom, we have uh, uh, we have the bird eye view, where every cell is essentially uh, one meter by one meter. Okay, and uh, uh, you can see that uh, in general, when things are moving forward, uh, we, you know we can estimate uh, uh, the um, um, Every single every single object, including um, cyclist, pedestrian, but most of them are cars. But one problem you notice that in the in the bottom, right? Certainly, the detection is not very stable. You can see that the box kind of jumping around, especially in the post estimation. So this is expected in the sense that uh, this method right now is still an image based method. Uh, we apply the detection algorithm on, on every single frame. There's no consistency over the video sequences. So this essentially motivate us to work on the second uh, extension problem we call the kinematic 3D object detection. So the goal for this work is that uh, we like to be able to develop a monocular video-based 3D detection systems, utilize the video as input because this is a very natural input for automatic driving, right? Uh, even for robotics. And we like to utilize the temporal motion as well as constraints using an effective three-dimensional common filter, uh, which is a classic you know, uh, tracking filter people have been using for a lot of 2D works. And finally, we also like to take one step further, improve the stability and accuracy of the detection algorithm uh, in the process of trying to recover what are the physical motions in the metric space. For example, what are the velocity? Of the, of, the, of the home camera, what are the velocity of every other car I'm seeing, right? For example, uh, we're showing you one example sequence where we estimated the home camera have the speed of seven miles per hour, while each of the rest of cars, we're also estimating its speed in terms of 13 miles per hour, seven and 28. And we also have the uh, green back to indicate its, its motion, its, uh, its uh, uh, travel direction basically. Yeah. On the right hand side in the bird eye view, because we're doing tracking in the process of all, so you can actually have a history of the previous car location. You can even do forecasting in the 3D space as well. Okay. So, uh, so what are the scenario for the, what are the previous work in this space? You know, video-based object detection has been done 
uh, previously in a lot of 2D object detection case. Uh, typically those work, uh, you know, work with 2D object flows and you want to kind of work feature maps and then you can aggregate features from both counter frame as well as previous frame. And uh, it typically help, you know, runtime efficiency because you don't have to apply the same algorithm to every single frame. And uh, usually those data assume minimum camera motion. So unlike automatic driving, we have constant uh, motion, but those, those cases uh, typical the camera motion is relatively smaller. Uh, however, in 3D object detection, there's no previous work in terms of doing video-based object, uh, object detection, okay? As we mentioned, we like to utilize a three-dimensional common filter. Uh, so because we think it's efficient and also it's a parameter-free algorithm, it can easily integrate, integrate a series of measurements over time. Uh, you're also trying to model uncertainty naturally using common filter, right? So you have uh, model uncertainty together with observation uncertainty can be combined uh, in, in, in a mathematical formulation. So this is nice. So for example, given the previous state variable, right? Uh, assuming it's a Gaussian distribution, you could apply a, a transformation matrix, which is a prediction step uh, based, up, based upon some physical uh, motion models. And this will give you a new updated state, right? And then updated state will be combined together with the measurements you are receiving from the current frame T. And this combination will eventually lead to the, the newer, you know, the next uh, state variables and this looping will essentially keep going, yeah? In this process, uh, there's a few challenges. Number one is that uh, you have to assume, you know, some sort of coherence for both the process or the model as well as observations, right? These have to be computed somehow. Secondly, you also have a known physical uh, motion model. You have to assume that uh, motion model for, for this to work. So uh, for the automatic driving case, the general challenge, uh, what we do is that we, we trying to, you know, physically model constraint so that uh, we say that the car can only move in the, in the direction of orientation, right? In other words, the orientation on estimation almost tell us that which direction the car will be moving, okay? So therefore the orientation estimation become quite important. And secondly, is that we like to decompose orientation, you know, into num a number variable instead of a single variable so that we can increase the stability and the robustness of the orientation estimation. And finally, we have a self-balancing 3D confidence so that we can try to have uh, uh, more understanding about, uh, about uncertainties because uncertainty is part of the, you know, common filtering requirement. Okay, so take a look at the self-balancing confidence score. The idea is that uh, you know, typical for uh, for detection problem, we typical people will typically you know having uh, having some confidence for the box by either estimating three-dimensional RU or people reuse the classification probability scores. Yeah, and instead uh, we want to define self-balancing laws, which will producing a confident. Uh, it can essentially try to help us you know uh, mining hard hard negative samples. So here's the one. Here's the equation we're using for this estimation. Uh, in this scheme, uh, you can see that we're trying to balance between two terms, right? When the 3D loss is small, right? Uh, when 3D loss is small and uh, uh, omega tend to be larger, means that right now I'm more confident, right? Because smaller L3D multiplied large omega is fine, uh, and uh, in that case, you know, uh, one minus one minus uh, one minus omega will, will become will become uh, lower. Uh, in other words, when L3D is larger, I'm less confident. In that case, I wish the omega will become smaller. So in that sense, you can see that it's, it's a trade-off between these two different, two different variables. So one benefit you can see that eventually if we compute the correlation, right, uh, between the score we're estimating as well as 3D RU, you can see that the correlation coefficient for our um, confidence is 0 0.4 almost. But if people using previous classification probability, you can only have the correlation coefficient of 0 0.25. So uh, higher correlation coefficient means that we have a better estimation of the of the competence. So overall, the framework is like is like this. So the we have a backbone network taking the counter frame T as an input. Uh, it will produce a feature map X, and then it will produce the classification, and the T is essentially the state variable, and omega is competence. Yeah. And the second part, we're trying to have an eco-motion estimation module will take 
the feature map from the current time t and the feature map from previous time t minus one and send into a very simple, you know, two layer eagle motion estimation. And eventually it will estimate uh, uh, phi and rho, which are the 6D translation as well as rotation, you know, the typical eagle uh, motion parameter. And then so the three dimensional common filter will take the tau that's a state variable and uh, doing the forecasting based on the motion model and get the, the tau t prime. So this will be the update or forecasted the state variables. And then I'm going to apply eagle motion to the state variable so that the eagle motion can be compensated, right? And because this is the important part. And then next we're we'll doing the association. You, you can build up history with the previous frame as well as doing updating. Updating essentially try to combine the, uh, uh, the model updating as well as observation and uh, based on the uncertainty to get the new state variable tau t. And this will essentially finish the, finish the, the, the updated step, okay? Um, so let's look at the, some results. And uh, uh, again, this will be tested on the KD database. Um, so we are testing on the 3D uh, detection performance. That's what's on the left-hand side. Right-hand side, the bird eye view detection performance. Uh, this is on the official test set, not on the validation one, two. Again, there are three different sets, easy, moderate, and hard. So you can see that compared to previous work on the 3D detection, uh, right now we're further improving uh, compared to AM, AM3D. Uh, this is a fairly recent work. I believe it's in this year CVPR20. And, uh, and the M3D up here, this is our previous ICCD work. And uh, so we further improve compared to, to this works. And not only that, if you compute uh, the efficiency, uh, because AM3D involve a, a number of networks. So it's not a single network. That's why uh, eventually the speed is roughly three times slower compared to us uh, in terms of running time. Um, so in the bird eye view, I would say overall, the two methods are competitive. They have similar performance. Uh, we are a little bit better on easy, but we are a little bit worse on the, on the heart, okay? So uh, not only that, we also evaluate our performance in terms of uh, velocity estimation as well as eagle motion estimation. So in eagle estimation, because eagle motion estimation, because we, we didn't do anything sophisticated, we have error about six miles per hour in eagle motion. Uh, for velocity estimation, the current error is about uh, eight to nine miles per hour. In other words, if the, if the car is driving at 30 miles per hour, our estimation can be anywhere from 21 to 39. So that's current kind of velocity estimation. So let's look at some results. So these are uh, some quantitative uh, results showing some uh, examples of different variety of estimation, but I think the video makes more sense. Uh, so over here, you can see that the top is ICCV work, uh, image-based uh, 3D detection. The bottom is uh, video-based detection work. Uh, so you can see that in the bottom, we're estimating the home um, camera speed, that's the current in my own speed. And uh, the yellow number on top of every box, they are essentially the velocity estimation for other, you know, detected cars. Uh, you can see that when I slow down, right? So everything, you know, become zero or almost zero. There's still one, two, you know, sometimes it will become one, two small, small numbers. Uh, but uh, you can see that the number uh, seems making sense. On the right-hand side, you can see we also have the tracking history for all the vehicles we are detecting uh, because we do do association over time. So you can, you can act, you are actually doing tracking. Uh, in the meantime, you could also do forecasting. You, you can follow the trajectory, predict into the future if you like, yeah. So uh, the nice thing I like about this is that everything is done in the 3D space using a single camera. Uh, so you can imagine this could be a, a, a kind of the framework uh, sort of built into the future. Uh, try to, in the future, we can further improve the eagle motion um, accuracy and so that the velocity estimation will become more accurate with a better velocity estimation. And uh, I think the video-based uh, information integration will become more precise, it will help uh, better, you know, detection system eventually. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like to, you know, watching this video, actually, I think this is a quite enjoyable to see how, how the detection, you know, estimation the different speed of, um, of object you, you, are, you are detecting right now. Yeah, so compared to the top, you can see certainly the uh, robustness is much better compared to top. 
especially uh, we don't have a lot of jettering like what we have on the top, in the top. Okay, so with that, let's move to the second part we call the monocular 3D object reconstruction. So this is, is also ongoing work. And the goal is that uh, giving a single image of a natural object, we like to be able to reconstruct the 3D uh, surfaces. Uh, in the sense that uh, you know the complete surface should be should be estimated, there. and uh, um, so this also uh, you know there's quite some previous work in the space, uh, but in general our our um, understanding is that the previous work may do very well for the uh, synthetic data, but they might have limited quality in terms of three uh, D. Uh, 3D shape reconstruction for the real data. And uh, typically previous work do not model albedo and lighting. And, uh, and also uh, very few of them try to leverage in the, uh, in the wild data for actually for training. Most of them are trained from synthetic data. Okay, so this is the kind of the problem we like to address. Uh, so uh, we like to be able to train tests on real data, uh, even though we would have ground truth. We like to have a complete generic object model, uh, including multiple components such as, you know, a segmented uh, uh, shape in terms of pose and uh, albedo and the lighting, right? By combining all four of them, we can actually synthesize a natural image, right? So this is essentially analyzed by synthesize. If I can do this uh, synthesis, I can actually have an analysis module to decompose the image into these four components. So that's the basic idea. So eventually, you know, giving an input image, we have encoder, we like to estimate, you know, lighting L, uh, camera projection matrix P, and FS is a shape latent code, FA is a video latent code. And the last two of them will be sent into decoder DS and DA, which are both implicit functions and do recover the occupancy field as well as color field. And then by using a differential render, you can combine all inf for information and having a reconstructed image. And uh, this should have, you know, smaller self-reconstruction loss compared to input data, right? So this framework essentially try to combine the model fitting, model learning together. And when this all trend, the SDA are basically the model itself. And uh, the E is basically the model fitting functions. So this framework was actually originally applied to face images. We have, uh, you know, a number of uh, CDPR paper as well as PAMI paper on this topic. And uh, right now we'd like to see how well this can be extended into generic objects and what are the challenges. This is what we're trying to face right now. Yeah. Um, so in terms of shape representation, we use the uh, implicit function, especially we uh, borrowed the idea uh, from Professor um, Hao Zhang in uh, Simon Fraser University in terms of branch the network output where uh, giving a shape code as well as a point X, Y, Z we eventually ge generate the four different branch and these are indicate the segmentation part labels actually. The max polling of those four parts will give me the occupancy estimation. So when occupancy value equal to one, it means that the point is inside the shape. Otherwise one means, uh, zero means outside the shape. And uh, for a video representation, we actually, you know, um, propose uh, somehow a new, uh, new way of doing it. That is uh, similar to the branch, the shape here, we have the branch a video as well, right? And which branch upon X, Y, Z is chosen actually is depending on the which shape you're chosen, uh, that makes sense. So that if one point belongs to the body of the car, eventually the albedo we're learning from C1 is also coming from the body. So you can see that we essentially have a parts level, uh, you know, uh, representation for both the albedo as well as uh, uh, shape. So in terms of rendering, uh, giving a point in the final render image, we have a light ray from the camera optical axis and shooting through the point into the space. And this will help us to compute which surface point we are essentially interacting by using the um, implicit function. And given the surface point, and now I can send this into the uh, decoder, uh, Abido decoder, get RGB based Abido information. And this will go through the render equation uh, where I have surface normal and lighting and eventually render generate the, 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 the color information of the point. Yeah. Um, so in terms of training, we have two stages. The first stage using synthetic data for training. Uh, so with that, we can learn the shape decoder as well as a video decoder and the encoder. And the second stage is unsupervised the joint training where we take image reconstruction loss, serial loss, as well as regulation terms, regulation terms. 
uh, to, to do the training. The serial law is trying to make sure that the projection of the 3D surface will be consistent with the estimated uh, 2D, uh, 2D silhouettes. So this is the eventual learned shape model. You can see that the shape model is quite continuous as well as cluster according to different uh, car types. Um, so with this shape space, you can see that eventually all we have to do is a very good encoder that can map a natural 2D image into one point in the space. If the mapping is precise, then we can generate a reconstructed 3D shape. So let's look at some results. So these are the qualitative comparison with previous uh, um, uh, 3D, um, single image 3D reconstruction algorithm on synthetic images. So most of the algorithm are doing fine, but our algorithm uh, are doing pretty good. Our algorithm can also generate the parts based uh, segmentation information. And this is a real image. Of course, this is much harder. You can see that the performance improvement seems to be more than the previous uh, case, as well as we're also generating the pass based labeling for, the, uh, for this uh, uh, case. So quantitative evaluation, we test on two different databases. One is Pascal 3D, one is the Pixel uh, 3D. Uh, notice that uh, when we compare with previous work, we have two different models, one is S, S means that we have a single model, single 3 dimensional model actually trained for multiple object category, okay? And the next one is the last column is actually the object specific model it means that for one object category, we train one model. So clearly, right, object specific model will have better performance. So therefore the, the chamfer distance error is, is, is smaller. Okay, the smaller the better. Uh, but no matter what, for both cases, even for generic models, we are better than you know um, previous method, which some of them are generic, some of them are object specific. Um, so eventually the goal of this line of research is that we like to be able to do 3DMM, hopefully for ImageNet, meaning that for any natural object category, we like to build a 3DMM model kind of what we have been doing right now. And uh, hopefully with our 3D model, we can do object specific fitting and to be able to recover the 3D uh, information. And uh, of course, this is a very challenging objective, right? Right now we can do it for a few category because we do have the support from the ShapeNet. But you know, ShapeNet only have 50 categories, but uh, ImageNet have a thousand. So, so there's still a huge, huge gap. There's a lot of uh, research opportunity here. Okay, so, so far I mentioned about detection and uh, uh, 3D reconstruction. In the lab, we're also working on other problems such as more low level vision as well as some uh, high level for some driving kind of problems. So due to the limited time, maybe I will spend next uh, three minutes and talk about uh, you know, two relevant work. Uh, one is what we published in last year's CVPR, which we call the depth completion, uh, essentially giving uh, RGB image as well as uh, sparse LiDAR. How do we generate the dense depth information or super resolved depth information? So conventional work typically have the smearing issue, meaning that you generate a lot of point with in between depths of the foreground and background. Those points actually does not exist. So this will cause problems for the subsequent detection problems. Uh, in comparison, our model does not have this kind of issue because we have a new non-parametric uh, called depth coefficient representation that can model the probability of possible depths in a, using a you know, 80 dimensional vector. And this will allow me to minimize the smearing issue. Uh, so this shows uh, some of the results where you have input sequence where bottom you have the uh, estimated the super resolved the depth information and th that is corresponding the bur view on the right hand side. So uh, in addition to depth completion, we also do monocular depth estimation. So this is the work actually published or will be shown up in this year on uh, CVPR in this week. Uh, so my student Shen Jie, he observed that, uh, you know, getting up RGB image, if you let him do both depth estimation and the semantic segmentation, he found that uh, in terms of the quality of the boundary, semantic segmentation have much high quality in terms of the boundary. So this gives him motivation to say that why don't we use the you know, high quality boundary information from the semantic segmentation to help the depth estimation also produce higher quality boundary. So this is his motivation. Uh, so to do that, he actually, you know, try to apply a morphing, essentially morph the estimated depths according to the boundary of the semantic segmentation, so that this morph the boundary will provide a next level supervision for the, for the network. 
and this will be done iteratively during the training process. So this will eventually lead to better quality, uh, especially on the boundary for the, for the depth estimation. So he shows that uh, actually for the first time, his self-supervised depth estimation can achieve the same absolute relative error compared to the supervised depth estimation method. So this was not possible previously. And so this is a kind of the surprising or interesting uh, observation we have. So in summary, uh, the take home message is that, uh, you know, 3D detection from 2D images are just in the beginning. And uh, we feel that the modeling and the recovering the motion actually may benefit detection. I think this is also very natural thing to do for the motion estimation, recover the physical motion. And finally, we like to say that, you know, fitting category specific 3D model can actually lead, uh, lead to numerical benefits such as reconstruction and the post estimation as well as the lighting estimation. Uh, I'd like to thank my students as well as sponsors uh, for, for working on different problems uh, in this area. Thanks for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Liu, for your, for your fantastic talk. And um, we have some questions from the audience. And, uh, and uh, let's say first, uh, uh, from the audience, um, the first question would be, do you, for, the, for 3D object detection, do you apply detection and tracking or, uh, or perform detection? I think he, he, what he, he wants to, to ask is whether you, when you do the, when you do the object detec 3D detection, you first do dete detection and later tracking the detection result, or you do perform per every frame detection. Um, uh, are you, I think he is referring to the new work we're talking about this uh, video based object mm -hmm. detection, right? I think so. I think so, so yes, yeah. in this work, uh, according to this uh, network architecture, yes, it is correct that for every new frame, for every current frame, we go through the conventional image based detection schemes, right? However, we are rely on the eagle motion estimation as well common filter to modify or update the detection result, update the single frame based detection result so that eventually the state variable tau t will be a more precise 3D boxes. Okay. Okay. So, so you can imagine this 3D common filter essentially is a, is a model without any parameter, right? It's, it's kind of a, a scheme that we are taking, you know, the estimation from the single frame as well as the model information to integrate information from the past into the newer results. Okay. Okay, I got you. So for yeah. the each new frame, you try to find the association between the, the last uh, previous frame in this case, right? Yes, we do do association. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah. Um, another, another question is um, how well does the proposed uh, method work in real scenarios? <laughs> And uh, uh, I guess it also referred to this work. Yeah, I think so. Uh, well, uh, the right now the issue is that there's not many database. I think we could try this kind of algorithms, right? Uh, first of all, you know, there's still quite some requirement for training this type of algorithm. For example, uh, for the new scenario, you need to have camera matrix. Camera have to be calibrated, right? Both mm -hmm. extrinsic parameters. Number one, number two is that for new scenario, typically you might want to have some label the 3D boxes for training purposes, at least for fine tuning purposes. So the short answer is that we don't know. Uh, I think okay. how to make this kind of model to be more transferable from database A to B to C or to real world scenario would be an interesting research question by itself. Okay, I think uh, in this case, I want to have a follow up question. And uh, I saw the current uh, 3D detection compared with 2D detection, 3D detection's accuracy is much, much lower. And uh, somehow quite a lot of time they have just uh, for zero IOU, zero bigger than 0 0.7, the accuracy maximum is something like 20, 20 some percent. What do you think is the right now the bottleneck of, so, of, of 3D object detection? Good question, good question. So this slide I'm showing, I, I, I was actually hiding this slide. <laughs> so if you look at this slide, this slide shows that uh, depend on the 3D IOU criteria. Right now, the criteria is 0.7, right? Mm -hmm. When it is 0.7, you can see that uh, the AP is very, very low. You know, for, for all, the, all the distance, all meters, uh, the AP is as low as, uh, you know, about 20%-ish, right? Mm -hmm. But if you relax the 3D IOU criteria to 0.5, to 0.5 or even 0.3, you can see that the performance will be a lot higher, even for 3D detection. 
So what it means is that uh, we typically, we don't have missing, much missing rate. We are detecting all the 3D boxes actually, but it's mm -hmm. just the, the, the location of the 3D box is not very precise in terms of the compared to ground truth, especially in the depths. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually quite a lot of work for 3D object detection using the depths. First they estimate the depths and then do the 2D detection in combination with the depth estimation together with the, the object normal object detection they try to do the 3d detection and do you do you think do you think this is something have you have you think about doing the similar thing or you you think quite right yeah, now so based on is, anchor base is better yeah so this is what we're trying to contrast with in the beginning right uh, you know uh, those approach the modularized approach has its mm -hmm. own benefits right uh, because it's easy maybe it's easy trying to figure out you know which module gets wrong you can do mm -hmm. more analysis but we felt that uh, you know the computation complexity of the model eventually is quite important. So we like to see that whether a single model is able to do what we want to do. Uh, so that's why we didn't did not want to have separate modules for doing depth estimation. Okay. Um, but yeah, uh, maybe some implicit depth estimation might be helpful within the network. And, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, maybe we have one more question. Um, so. In your 3D MM and for the for albedo and the shape uh, for those two um, encoder and the decoder network, do you change separately and then combine them together or you train them simultaneously? Uh, we have multi-stage of training process. The first stage is we train the shape decoder first. Uh -huh. Okay, Because shape decoder, you can train just based on the voxelized uh, 3D models. You don't have to bring, you don't have to involve images. Mm -hmm. And once that's been trained, we actually fix the shape decoder. We never update it. However, mm -hmm. for the Abido, uh, Abido decoder as well as uh, as well as the final encoder, both two of them will be updated in, when, 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 whenever we bring the real image into the training process, uh, because okay. both of them are depending are benefit can be benefited from the real images. Okay. Uh, uh Another question for myself is: uh, is when in your three D object detection and you use um, you use a, something like a, a lantern and to control how much weight you gave to the you gave to the how much confidence you gave to the to the three D loss versus the two D loss and what, do you have a number that is normal? What is the confidence normally you assign? Oh. So, so the omega is a confidence we're estimated, yeah. right? Omega goes through a um, um, goes through a, a sigma function, so it's it's guaranteed to between zero and one. So it's normalized yeah. the variable. So and, do you have uh, a number? And because uh, if yeah, if you have something omega is very small, that means you always you you three D loss is always very, very unconfident. And but if you on the other side, if you if you have very big number for, for omega and you that means you the, the 3D object, the 3D loss is always very high. And uh, and that really determines whether later you the, the efficiency of the of different losses. So the only way we're utilizing the omega is by using common filter. Because in mm. common filter you're trying to balance the uncertainty from the model prediction from the observation, right? If the if the uncertainty from the observation is very very high, uh, the high uncertainty, you will, you will rely on the model prediction to say where the next box. In mm -hmm. comparison, if the uncertainty of the observation is very low, I'm so confident I will almost forget about the model. Only use my you know estimated uh, uh, location from the current frame as my final estimation. Mm -hmm. So therefore, common filter naturally combine the information from model prediction as well as observation. Okay. And that's how the omega will be used in in the in the fusion process. Okay. And and uh, and uh, do you have something like an estimation from the omega and the how in, in the in the in the in common filter in in the co the common filter always estimate what is in the range uh, of omega here. So omega can be anywhere from zero to one. Uh, okay. For example, this is a typical kind of the uh, range we're estimating. I would say most of them, most of them look like to be you know somewhere from zero point five to 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 one point zero. Okay. And uh, you can see that right now the correlation coefficient is not so high; it's only zero point four. 
okay. which means that the omega is only somewhat indicative of the 3D RU, but it's still not very precise. Okay. Right? If yeah, you have okay. a very good omega estimation, I think this will be very beneficial for, <laughs> yeah. for information integration over time. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Liu. I think we run out of time and, uh, for the next speaker. And uh, I would like to thank you again in representing you know, another one more than 100 people here. Sure, thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.